Hello everyone, my name is Mona and I'm a learning team intern at the Jewish Museum. Welcome to another Object Talk. So this week is Refugee Week. And for those of you who do not know what Refugee Week is, Refugee Week is a festival which celebrates the contributions, creativity and resilience of refugees and people seeking sanctuary. So this is why I've chosen to share with you an object linked to the 45th Aid Society. And I will share this object with you now. So in the picture, we can see members of the 45th Aid Society together with their children celebrating Purim. The 45th Aid Society is an organization which was founded by the boys, child survivors of the Holocaust, who found refuge in the UK. Today, I want to tell you the stories of how they built a life after the war, how they established strong ones of friendship and companionship, and how they did not just take from society, but also gave back. To get to know who the 45th Aid Society is, we have to have a look at the stories of the boys and their journey to the UK. So let's start with this picture. We can see children of different age groups standing and looking into the camera. Those children and a few more are the ones who would enter our history books as the boys. The picture was taken in Prague in 1945, shortly after liberation. Their rescue to the UK was organized by the Central British Fund for German Jewelry, CBF, which today is known as World Jewish Relief. One of the leading figures to organize the scheme was Leonard Montefiore. He did not just want to bring surviving children over to the UK, but wanted to take care of them as well. He advocated for their well-being and convinced the British government to take in 1,000 children who were 16 or younger. This age limit was officially raised to 18 in 1946. The government would grant them free visas for two years, but the CBF was entirely responsible for everything else. They had to agree to organize all the financing themselves so their taxpayers did not have to pay a penny. For this purpose, they placed ads in newspapers. But it was not very easy to raise money as, due to the war, the economic situation was difficult. In the end, it was just managed to raise money for 732 children, although just 730 actually came to Britain. I introduced you to Leonard Montefiore, but there was another person who was key to everything, and that was Joey Schwartz, the European Director of the American Joint Jewish Distribution Committee, short JDC. Schwartz firmly believed that Jewish people would not have a future in Eastern and Central Europe. That's also one of the reasons why many children originally came from those parts of Europe, although the Holocaust had taken place in whole Europe. Montefiore and Schwarz formed a partnership. A CBF subcommittee was established, which was responsible for locating children and organizing their airlift to Britain. In the end, the decision where to go was up to the children. This was a change of plan, as at first, Allied forces had wanted to bring the children out of Germany. But UNRRA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, saw the bonds children had formed with each other and aid workers, and they were hesitant to break them. Many chose to come to Britain, so the boys came in five different groups. The first group arrived in Great Britain in 1945 and the last one in 1948. However, if we take a closer look at the picture, we cannot just see boys, but also girls. Although the group is called the boys, it did not exclusively consist of boys. 204 girls came to Britain as part of Montefiore's scheme. After their arrival, the children came to camps. In those places, they learned English, they were cared for mentally and physically, and they had the, ch the chance and the space to just enjoy themselves. The first group, which came to the UK in 1945, went to Windermere in the Lake District, and we do have some pictures from that time. So in this picture, for instance, we can see children watching King, Hen King Henry VIII, and we can see them rowing on the lake in the next picture, and we can also see them partaking in an English class. Many of those children described their arrival in the UK as paradise. It was the first time for them after a very long time to have a proper meal, to sleep in a real and clean bed and to participate in leisure activities. The aim of the scheme was to help them recover and to help them to regain independence, strength and confidence. Moreover, one wanted to ensure their integration into society. Furthermore, they went on holidays together. And in this picture, we can see boys of the Gateshead Hostel Group camping. In our next picture, 
we can see two friends spending some time together at the seaside in Brighton. So the children had each other and formed unique and strong bonds. It is not always easy to come to a new country, to learn a new language and to adapt to a different way of living. The wife of Koppel Kendall, who came to Windermere in 1945, described the group of her husband as the following. They all became a new family, and even today, they are still one big family. They really needed each other to talk to, as they all understood each other, having li lived through similar experiences. Some of them got a foothold here in the UK. They found jobs, had families of their own, and rebuilt their lives. Some chose to emigrate to, for example, the United States. In 1963, so 18 years after the first group had come to the UK, the boys founded an organization called the 45 Aid Society. The aim of that charitable organization was to have a fun support network for each other and to give something back to society. The boys have raised thousands of pounds over the years with which they have supported miscellaneous good causes around the globe. As a group of, group of friends, they celebrated together. So we can see this in this picture, which is from the early 1960s, in which members of the 45 Aid Society are gathering to celebrate Purim with their children. In the next picture, we can see them on a Hanukkah party. Some didn't just found good friends, but also their life partners. And we do have a picture of Ruby and Bernhard Dryhorn's wedding, which was held in Manchester in 1959. The groom, second from right, and his best man, second from left, were both Auschwitz survivors. Moreover, the boys faced their past together. They commemorated and paid tribute to those who did not survive. This picture was taken on the 40th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in Auschwitz-Birkenau. On a regular basis, the members of the society met to see each other again. And this picture was taken at a reunion in Israel in the 1970s, and we can see them smiling and drinking together. And if we look closely enough, we can see a camera on someone's lap with which he could capture moments of this evening. So the next picture, yeah, um, it's very similar to the one I have shown you at first, but this time it isn't black and white anymore. The people are different as well. We do not have only children and teenagers anymore, but adults and elderly people too. This picture shows the second and third generation together with some of the boys in Prague in 2019. Over the years, many passed away and some were just too ill to travel to participate in the reunion. At one reunion in 2015, Ben Halfgott said, incredibly, despite all that my family suffered in the Holocaust, here in 2015 are three generations of the Halfgott family. To me, this is triumph over adversity. As they were getting older and fewer, the 45 Aid Society was handed over to the second and third generation. Today, it is still a support network for its members and their families, but further, it also focuses on keeping the testimonies of the boys alive. Through events and educational workshops, the testimonies become accessible to the public. The 45th Aid Society continues to tell the stories of their parents and grandparents and ensures that the legacy won't be forgotten. In the past years, a research team has been established which, re with, which researches the collective and individual stories of the boys. Although there are various resources, the team wanted to gather all the information in one place. So this research project is led by the journalist Rosie Whitehouse and the team consists of people from the third generation. The research is on the one hand, a historical research tool, but on the other hand, it is a memorial for the boys their families and their work. One, in my opinion, amazing project was the creation of a memory kilt, which celebrates the life of the boys and retells parts of their stories. You can see part of the memory kilt in this picture. Survivors and their families worked on the kilt together. Each kilt is different, each and each one tells a different story, but all of them are inspiring and emotional. I want to share a particular one with you. And this is this one, which was made by Bella Rosenthal. And she worked her memories of arriving to a new country into her kilt. She explained it this way. The square represents myself as a young girl alone arriving in a strange country. The blue bells remind me of the first spring in England where there were carpets of blue bells. It was such an amazing sight. The smell was overwhelming. 
The rainbow signifies a new start in life, a beautiful symbolism and a unique and personal memory. But let's go back to Prague. So Ben Helfgott, one of the boys, who was very proud of the society and its achievements, described his work with the society and the influence on his life like this. Our friendships matured into bonds of brotherhood when we grew to be adults, created our own families and integrated into local communities. Throughout, we have nurtured one another, derived comfort, encouragement, moral support, pleasure and reward. It is the establishment of the 45 Aid Society that held us together and provided us with the opportunity to continue as a cohesive group. This experience of friendship and brotherhood is our strength. The framework and foundation on which we have built our lives. Our society has given us a collective voice and offered us the opportunity to show how we have overcome trauma with dignity and independence. It shows us how important a strong bond and a solid base is for people who, have, who arrive in a new country. The 45 Aid Society has been contributing to society for almost 60 years now. Their creative projects preserve the incredible and inspiring legacy of the boys. I will stop my screen share now and I want to thank you for your attention. So thank you very much and see you for our next object talk next week. <laughs>